Hi, everyone. I think there are still some people joining, but let's make a start. We've got a, a busy agenda to get through. So a very, very warm welcome from a chilly Scotland uh, around the world to people joining. Thanks a lot for being with us today. Um, before we start, just a reminder that this session is being recorded um, and will be circulated out to everybody after. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to be here for the launch of Plan Vivo Nature or PV Nature, the first operational global high integrity biodiversity standard. Um, I'd like to start with a bit of an introduction from the Plan Vivo side of why we've done PV Nature and, and what it means for us. And then we've got a great panel of speakers to follow uh, to, to give you some different perspectives. So our aim with PV Nature is to provide an instrument to channel responsible finance to communities to enable them to deliver impact for nature, for climate, and for people. Plan Vivo's role in this is we are an independent certification body. Um, so we're not involved in developing projects. We're not involved in selling credits. We provide a standard of requirements that's used to certify projects, and in this case, to enable them to generate biodiversity certificates, Plan Vivo biodiversity certificates, PVDCs or biodiversity credits. Um, we've been doing this approach for over 25 years in the voluntary carbon market, and we see PV Nature as a way to scale up this impact in a way which is complementary to what we do in the VCM. So we're, we follow a very similar process. We have an independent standard. We have third-party validation and verification. We have credits that are issued on a registry, and there are certain requirements around those uh, credits being real, additional, verified, etc. Um, and where it's a little bit different from the VCM is these certificates are not used for offsets. This is aimed at the voluntary biodiversity market, which is emerging, uh, and in particular, the nature positive movement for organizations looking to make a positive contribution to nature conservation or restoration. How Plant Vivo is different uh, to other offerings in this new market I think, as I mentioned, all of these credits uh, or certificates must be issued by us as an independent certification body. Uh, we see that as being central to high integrity. Um, all the biodiversity certificates are issued based on real, additional, and evidence-based biodiversity outcomes that have been achieved. And core to the Plan Vivo values, all of the projects need to show that these projects are being community-led that we have uh, strong community engagement, FPIC processes, uh, social and environmental safeguards, that we have fair and equitable benefit sharing of the revenues generated from the sale of, of biodiversity certificates, and that all projects are having a holistic impact. So not just for biodiversity, but also for people and for climate. And I guess an important point to emphasize is we're now live and operational. So that's a, a key difference. There's a, a lot of work in this market, but uh, I think really important to be able to move from those ideas, those frameworks into something which is really operational. We've been developing PV Nature over the last two years. We've had lots of inputs from uh, project partners. Uh, we've had two working groups. We've had public consultations. We've also been working uh, very closely with the team at Pivotal to co-design uh, the methodology, the PV Nature methodology. And again, this, in line with this focus on high integrity, this methodology places a, places a premium on auditable data uh, and evidence-based biodiversity outcomes. So at the same time, we want to make sure that we're really valuing that local knowledge and that we're making sure that communities can engage both in the activities to conserve and restore nature and also in the monitoring uh, of the data that's demonstrating that that's been delivered. So a huge thanks to everybody uh, who's contributed to date, and we'll talk a bit more about that later. So enough from me. What, what can you expect from the next 50 minutes or so? Well, this is not a, a panel discussion or a Q&A session. It's really meant as an informational session where we give you different perspectives of this new market. Um, and we're really delighted to have Joe Elias, a Global Director of Conservation at Fauna and Flora with us. Joe will start us off by giving a perspective of the potential of these new biodiversity markets, in particular, the importance of high integrity and locally led action. 
Then Joe will be followed by our own biodiversity coordinator, Torrell. Uh, Torrell will talk in a little bit more detail what PV Nature looks like. How will it work in practice? Um, what's the credit or certificate look like? Uh, and how will it be measured? Uh, and also give you a snapshot of some of the launch projects uh, that are starting this exciting journey with us. Um, we're then excited to have a recorded presentation from Pauline Nantongo. Pauline's Executive Director of Ecotrust. Uh, she's also on the uh, High Level Advisory Panel for Biodiversity Credits. Pauline is leading one of our launch projects in Uganda. Uh, Pauline's been working with Plan Vivo for many years and really knows the model. And she's going to give you um, a, a, an overview of our project in Uganda, which is working with uh, chimpanzee habitat, which is very exciting. Pauline's traveling back from COP, so that's why we've got a pre-recorded uh, presentation from her. And then last but not least, we'll finish with the market perspective uh, from Nicola Rodewald from Good Carbon. So obviously, it's an exciting uh, potential here. But one of the things we really need to get our head around is what's the market demand for these credits and certificates? And how can we make sure we're helping to steer projects to design what's needed and also uh, understand, uh, help the market to understand having what having real high integrity impact looks like. So we'll hear from Nicola at the end. So um, without further ado, I think I'll uh, pass over to Joe to start us off and I'll join you back at the end to do a bit of a wrap up. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Keith. Um, greetings, everyone. Uh, as Keith says, I'm Joe. I'm the Global Director of Conservation at Fauna and Flora. I'm really excited to be talking to you today. Um, we recognize this urgent, huge opportunity to deliver a high integrity biodiversity credits market as quickly as possible. Um, we note in particular the um, funding gap that this, we anticipate this as helping, well, we very much hope this will help to fill um, the $800 billion a year estimate for what we need to meet the goals of the global biodiversity framework. And the really important fact that the available financial instruments and financial flows are actually not reaching the local level in critical high biodiversity value areas. And that's really what I think today is primarily about, because we therefore welcome the launch of the Plan Vivo standard. This is a very exciting opportunity to initiate this market. And we welcome the chance to talk to you today in the seminar as we all seek to drive forward this shared ambition, particularly for high integrity in this, in this market as it develops. Next slide, please. So for those who, of you who don't know Fauna and Flora, a quick introduction. Um, we are a global biodiversity conservation NGO, um, very long standing, working with local partners across more than, 400, more than 300 sites in 40 countries. Um, to deliver locally led inclusive conservation. And we very much believe and our work is centered on the fact that nature conservation efforts really only succeed if they're done with uh, integrity, with local legitimacy and therefore sustainability as they're designed. So in delivering on the global biodiversity framework, this must mean balancing the local with the global as we develop those much needed metrics and measures of success as well as the methodologies and tools that we need. Um, for example, we particularly need to reconcile the wonderful potential objectivity and cost effectiveness of remote global data sets and digital intelligence analytics. We need to combine that with local knowledge, local values and local approaches to nature conservation. Next slide, please. So why biodiversity credits when there's a plethora of, of wonderful instruments available to us already? And many of you listening to this will be working on or very much familiar with the um, this honeycomb of mechanisms that we have to choose from. Well, these instruments, even when fully deployed, currently leave, leave a huge gap of unmet local costs of nature conservation and restoration. And we all believe that biodiversity credits, and we hope that biodiversity credits hold the potential to reward areas that are perhaps lower in carbon stock, but high in biodiversity value, or areas where 
carbon stock might not be under immediate threat, but the costs of conservation are known to be very high. But we also recognize that these existing instruments must blend with the biodiversity credits layers as they emerge. So we need to make sure that these there is um, accommodation between all of these instruments and, and a symmetry there. And we recognize in particular within the uh, carbon credit market, within the vo voluntary carbon credit market, there's much to be done to, to align what's emerging there with the social and ecological benefits that are necessary and that can be delivered through biodiversity credits. Next slide, please. So fauna and flora is engaging at two scales. Um, at the market scale, um, we are helping with the development of principles, standards, and methodologies, noting in particular that the need to put indigenous peoples and local community groups at the forefront of market development. And this is what underlies our strategic partnership with the Plan Vivo Foundation and with others who align with our values and who support locally led conservation initiatives. And then we're also deploying at project level our science and our technical knowledge to support um, uh, all our local partner organizations as they test and implement evolving methodologies here. Next slide, please. So what are the key conditions that we see for building a viable biodiversity credits market? Well, I think we can all agree that they must be real, verifiable and robust. They must be science-based, measurable, and include auditable units of uplift. And those that's commonly agreed against all those trying to develop this market. But we would say they must also be practical and locally accessible with participatory methodologies and tools that can reflect local priorities and capacities while respecting those agreed common rules. And of course, pricing is critical. Their pricing must be such as to adequately move finance to local level and to more than fully cover the local costs and appropriate and necessary benefit sharing mechanisms. If we can't deliver this, the market will be unsustainable. Next slide, please. We also note the need to differentiate biodiversity credits from biodiversity offset, offsets, which will be um, something that I would imagine most of, the, most of you listening will be very familiar with this differentiation, but it seems very important to maintain it. Um, we recognize and uh, support the fact that offsets have long been used by companies as a means of mitigating their direct residual impacts on nature, particularly where those can be third party verified. But we also note the many challenges in this, these markets to date, not least those of finding true equivalents and for those corporates with complex supply chains. So how big will the non-offset biodiversity credit market be? Um, this is clearly a, a matter of huge debate at the moment and a great deal of research and quite a lot of market creation. So I note the World Economic Forum and McKinsey report that was launched at Dubai this week, which highlights their estimates of a potential market of $2 billion per annum by 2030 and $69 billion per annum possibly by 2050. Um, these figures include a prediction of uh, a rapidly growing section of voluntary corporate demand for non-offset credits. And this is clearly the a critical point of interest here, and I think we'll be hearing a bit more about this in a minute. But uh, I would just highlight that from Fauna and Flora's point of view, we see four possible sources for that non-offset market growth. Um, just learning from our own work with corporates. First, the, the growing voluntary and mandatory disclosure requirements, noting particularly the um, task force on nature related financial disclosures, which is creating opportunities for reputational gains associated with being nature positive. Second, the demand from financial institutions and investors directly, but also the pressure they will put on their corporate clients to push for a, a move to becoming nature positive. Thirdly, the growing acknowledgement of uh, dependencies and risks in supply chains that are possibly less direct, such as inputs from soil, water, and clean air, and so on, all supported by nature. 
And fourth and finally, a wish to contribute to nature recovery beyond a corporate's own impact. So this is moving into a more of a scope four from a scope three type um, investment, which would be corporates as good citizens. Um, so next slide, please. So uh, on that, I just wish to say congratulations to the Plan Vivo team. Um, this is a very exciting day for you and for all of your partner organizations. Um, for anyone interested in talking further to Fauna and Flora about our position, I note the QR code in the top right of the screen will link you to our position on biodiversity credits, in particular, emphasizing the need for locally led approaches. Uh, thank you very much. And I will now hand over to Toro. Thank you, Joe. Uh, of course, as expected um, during this session, I think my camera has stopped working. So apologies for that. Um, oops. Me. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks again for joining this webinar. Uh, my name is Toral, and I'm the Biodiversity Coordinator at Plan Vivo. Um, today, I'm just going to present to you a bit more details on what PV Nature entails and how it is an opportunity to invest in high integrity impact. So as Keith mentioned, the Plan Vivo standard is a certification to enable the issuance of biodiversity certificates. It is a mechanism to channel responsible investment into the hands of indigenous peoples and local communities, which in turn mobilizes resources and incentivizes conservation restoration of biodiversity. So through the development of this certification, we've had to make several decisions and trade-offs. However, based on 25 years of experience uh, running a carbon certification in the voluntary carbon market, we have come to know that there are some non-negotiables um, that are needed to set the minimum standard. So this includes ensuring a holistic impact, building the resilience for nature, people and climate together, ensuring transparency and accountability, particularly in how benefits are distributed amongst indigenous peoples and local communities, but also ensuring transparency and accountability in the trade of these certificates and ensuring that the outcomes generated from these projects are real robust and verified so that we can truly generate progress towards the global goals for nature recovery. So PV Nature has been in development for about two years now. It's included a lot of scoping and discussions. We've been supported by two working groups um, consisting of project developers, different biodiversity experts, conservation organizations, and a markets group, uh, both who have been advising us and helping us navigate through this new space. We've had input from several pilot projects and launch projects providing the on the ground perspective, particularly because they're globally spread across different ecosystems and habitats and uh, with varying stakeholders and communities involved. Um, when it comes to the development of the standard documentation, this has been a very iterative process and will continue to be so as we as we implement PV Nature. With multiple rounds of feedback and review, we have undergone two public consultations as well as an academic technical review to get that peer review scientific perspective. The work and the development of PV Nature has been very collaborative. We've had many wonderful partners supporting us and helping us to develop this, um, as well as aligning with larger initiatives such as the Biodiversity Credit Alliance and the World Economic Forum. So what can you expect from this launch and to happen next? In the immediate term, uh, the core PV Nature documentation will be available on our website from Monday 11th December, including the response to the second public cons consultation that we ran on the PV Nature methodology um, with the most recent changes and the justifications to those. Eligibility checks and the application process for terrestrial projects will also be open uh, whilst we continue working closely with our pilot and launch projects to get them officially validated and registered. Then over the next coming months to a year, we'll be working to produce more supporting documentation, different types of guidance and manuals to be published as soon as possible. 
whilst continue to work with a selected number of marine projects to refine the methodology approach for marine ecosystems. And as a result, there will be updates to the methodology based on data collected uh, from the field, as well as innovation in various monitoring tools. So as I said, on Monday 11th, you will be able to find the core PV Nature documentation available for download on our website. This includes the project requirements, the methodology and the data protocol, uh, auditing requirements and a glossary, as well as supporting documentation such as a procedures manual, some tools and relevant templates for project application. If we look a little bit closer at some of the core documentation, particularly the project requirements, this is a document which sets out the criteria that projects must demonstrate compliance with in order to be certified. It includes details around eligible interventions, stakeholder engagement, project design and logic, how to conduct the monitoring and reporting over the project period, and finally, project governance and different administration criteria. Particularly, these criteria ensure that the projects are designed with a participatory governance model, particularly around community-led monitoring, ensuring all the stakeholders have been engaged by the free prior and consent, consent process, and clear grievance mechanism, mechanisms are in place to relay back feedback. Importantly for Plan Vivo, there needs to be clear benefit sharing distribution models, whereby at least 60% of the revenue is uh, handed back directly into the community and that there are appropriate safeguards in place to mitigate any risks. So when it comes to the methodology, um, the, this has been designed in partnership with Pivotal. Um, there has been a lot of decision making and choices that we have to make when designing the approach. Namely, we want to ensure the approach can have community engagement within the monitoring process, that we're using science-based approaches to result in outcomes that align with the global goals that we're trying to meet. We want to ensure the approach can be scaled up but remain affordable and produces results that are evidence-based which can be compared and repeated over time. Importantly, we want to ensure that all the data can be independently audited by third parties. So through this, there are two types of projects that will be uh, eligible for certification. The first is conservation projects that need to demonstrate their conserving areas with existing high biodiversity value. And second, restoration projects aiming to restore pre uh, areas that have been previously degraded. So when it comes to uh, the, the quantification of biodiversity, I'm not going to go into details of the methodology as this will all be available on our website in, uh, in a couple of days. But broadly, the principles include measuring change in broad species groups, such as birds, fish, plants, etc., in combination with habitat data that tells us about the land use and the ecosystem quality. So projects will collect this data annually so that we can have a reliable as possible understanding of change on the ground. And it will be measured using digital data recorders such as camera traps, acoustic monitors, et cetera. And not only will this make it easy and accessible for communities to lead on the monitoring, but allows the data to be more, or more reliably audited. The collected data will be analyzed both by machine learning and human expert annotators with the results tracking a general trend in ecosystem health. So it's important to note that this methodology is not trying to have a complete census of every living organism within a project, but rather to use well-studied, well-known metrics and indicators to track general change over time. Uh, the resulting unit of measure will be a percentage change per hectare per year and will differ between conservation and restoration projects. So for conservation projects, they will be rewarded with certificates uh, for maintaining their baseline. That is, if a site conserves 100% of the baseline, they will be rewarded with a set number of certificates per hectare. For restoration projects, certificates are rewarded for gains relative to the baseline. So that's equal to a 1% gain uh, in one year per hectare. So what does the application process for projects look like? 
Generally, all projects need to demonstrate additionality along with a realistic theory of change, as well as have the ability and capacity to conduct detailed st stakeholder engagement. The application process has various steps, uh, which is outlined in the infographic here and available as well in the procedures manual, which will be online in a couple of days. In general, projects need to submit, submit a concept note, which is known as a PIN. And after approval, they will need to submit a more detailed project design document, which is reviewed both by the Plan Viva Secretariat and an independent technical review panel, which is made up of a body of uh, ex uh, biodiversity experts. So they will be checking for alignment, not only with the standard, but also eco-regional objectives. Timescales uh, for projects for registration vary based on size and capacity. But as I said, all of the details for each of these steps will be in the procedures manual uh, online. Um, you'll notice that there are a number of different parties involved in the certification process. So just to be clear on the roles or, and responsibilities of each of these, Plan Viva, of course, are the certifier against the, uh, against the standard. Projects are aiming to gain the certification um, whilst applying PV Nature. Pivotal are a third party biodiversity data analytics and methodology development partner. Um, the technical review panel is a group of independent experts who will be assessing the project against the standard. And finally, validation and verification bodies and independent experts are third party auditing bodies who will determine conformance with PV Nature, both through desk-based review and on-site review. So what is the result of this certification? Projects will be able to generate Plan Vivo biodiversity certificates, which are also known as PVBCs. Uh, one of these PVBCs are representative of biodiversity, climate, and community impact that have been additional and have been verified. Many of these projects will have direct links to the global biodiversity framework, uh, a few of which have been listed here today, um, mainly around conserving 30% of global land and seas by 2030, reducing impacts around invasive species and climate change, and really importantly, uh, mobilizing resources and building capacity and strengthening links in those uh, projects across the globe. When it comes to pricing of these certificates, uh, this will of course vary based on the size and the story of the project. Um, and of course, as the market establishes, this will also be set to change, but Plan Vivo guides projects to reflect the price around the minimum cost of doing work and enough to reward and incentivize the custodians of nature. So I hope that gave you a good flavor of uh, what the standard entails. Just to put it in a little bit more context, I'm gonna to present to you three project examples who we are already working with um, and uh, aiming to get certified and registered as soon as possible. The first example is protecting and restoring the Solent seascape um, being coordinated by the Blue Marine Foundation. It's located between mainland England and the Isle of Wight, spanning over 500 kilometers squared. The, the area is heavily populated with increasing coastal pressure, um, disturbance and fragmentation. And in, the main activities include protecting those existing habitats and actively restoring the areas that have been previously degraded with ongoing scientific monitoring and different levels of community engagement. So the impact for this will lead to enhanced biodiversity of those habitats climate impact through carbon sequestration and community impact through a co-creation of a long-term recovery plan to engage and empower local communities. The second project example is a conservation project uh, in the Finbos region of South Africa, known as the Flower Valley. It's being coordinated by the Grootbos Foundation and Fauna and Flora. The key activities for this project include invasive species management and fire control, which will lead to maintaining the native species richness and uh, soil quality, as well as reducing excessive fires in the region. It will also contribute to enhanced carbon stocks and build on those sustainable economies. And the final project example to showcase today is the, as a project in Northern Zimbabwe managed by Wild is Life. This is allowing us to develop a conservation project at scale 
And the area is extremely biodiverse with the main project activities being uh, around improved patrolling, controlled fire management, increased connectivity through wildlife corridors and long-term com community development programs. So there's also scope for restoration within this project and the outcomes for the project will result in increased species diversity, improved carbon sequestration through decreased burning and decreased deforestation, and improved li livelihoods, particularly around health, education, and infrastructure. So that's all from me. I'm gonna switch to a presentation by Pauline. As Keith already introduced, Pauline is uh, the director of EcoTrust Uganda. She's also a member of the International Advisory Panel on Biodiversity Credits. Um, Pauline was traveling today and so has prepared a recording of her presentation uh, for us today. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for this opportunity to share with you our experiences with uh, biodiversity credits, which we have used to incentivize communities that are restoring connectivity between tropical high rainforests uh, in southwestern Uganda. I work with the Environmental Conservation Trust of Uganda, and my name is Pauline Nantongo Kalunda. This is a conservation financing organization that operates on a triple bottom line. Every investment that we make delivers biodiversity conservation benefits, climate change mitigation and adaptation uh, benefits, as well as uh, livelihood benefits. Um, the biocredits project that we have is targeting an area that used to be tropical high rainforest about 20, 40 years ago. This area was all covered in um, tropical high rainforest, but some were protected and some, er some were left outside the protected area system for agricultural expansion. But over the years, uh, wildlife continues to move between the big forest blocks which has caused a lot of uh, human wildlife conflict because uh, in, in linking between the large forest blocks between Budongo and Bugoma, wildlife also wanders into people's farms and they, it cooperates. And there's a lot of tension between wildlife and, um, and, and, the human, uh, and the humans that live in that area. So we have this community led, <clears throat> we have this community designed, community owned, community-led project where the experts and all the stakeholders in, that work in the area sat down and studied the movement of wildlife and identified the areas that need to be forested for the landscape to continue providing its connectivity functions. So the blocks that you see in uh, green, dark green and light green, those are protected areas. But the ones you see in red are the linkages that we need to reforest for this corridor to continue being uh, contiguous so that wildlife can have a line of least resistance to move through without causing havoc um, to the livelihoods that live in the area. So we have sat down with the communities that own this land. Uh, some of it they own as individuals, but some of it is still public land that they could have chosen to expand their agriculture activities into. The communities and the public owned or that is public, nobody owns, the communities have formed what they call communal land associations and they've decided as a collective to set aside those pieces of land to reforest them. The main objective for the, for, for the community is actually water because these are riverine areas which also provide the water for the communities around. But it is also the same area where the chimpanzees uh, walk across because they are also in search of water and food. So they've, they've decided that if they forest these areas, they will create a, a free zone where the chimpanzees can move across, but plus other forms of, of wildlife. So we've come up with a model where the communities are able to share their vision or to show their vision and then that vision has a biodiversity component it has a livelihoods component a livelihood component includes um, controlling human wildlife conflict but it also includes 
biodiversity-based livelihoods, as well as um, the harnessing of traditional knowledge and promotion of innovation. So for us as experts, we've picked those components of the community vision and technically specified them to design a biocredits project. So it's a project that is, is, is presented in, in a scientific form, but it has maintained the authenticity of the community vision. This is how it, it, it works together. On, on this other side, you have the restoration plan that is highly technical, but then that restoration plan has been informed by the community vision, but also substantiated by expert surveys, expert biodiversity surveys, uh, baseline inventory um, assessments, for example, to clearly specify the most preferred routes by the chimpanzees. So it's based on a very heavy, high level technical basis, yet it also demonstrates or projects the community vision, the biodiversity-based livelihoods, the, the, the cultural heritage, the prevention of, of human wildlife conflict, as well as them utilizing their knowledge and documenting what they know. And, and even that knowledge has been um, integrated into the monitoring the monitoring program as we have it so we have a very scientific monitoring program that will be supported by uh, technology um, uh, bioacoustics and uh, camera traps but alongside that we also have a community based monitoring monitoring program the indicators we have the high level scientific indicators but we also have the community uh, ecological indicators, for example, indicators of change of seasons, indicators of uh, of the presence of, of, of vegetables, indicators of the presence of resources that they are looking for, but also the community-based monitoring program is monitoring the threats, is monitoring any presence of um, snares and traps for, for, for any human wildlife conflict, but it is also monitoring the, the implementation of the restoration of the restoration work so so it's really a community it's been designed to be owned managed and for and by and by um the community um we 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 are building on on the relationship that we already have with a diverse um spectrum of uh, of uh, funders most of them are, are public donors, but also uh, carbon buyers. So we would like to engage our carbon buyers. Currently, we are commoditizing this or we are mobilizing the financial flows by selling very high quality carbon credits. So we, we would like to get the story of biocredits of the biodiversity benefits to the same audience that we have, to be able to reward that element of uh, of of the stewardship. Uh, thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Thanks to Pauline uh, via video there, and I think really fantastic to hear, you know, a real practical example of how. This can be applied on the ground. I think that's uh, that's really important, as as Joe said at the start. It's about how you engage with local people uh, to deliver this. So a great a great way to frame that. And um, so uh, last we move to Nicola Rodewald to. So you've heard the more the supply perspective there from the projects, and we're going to end uh, with the demand side and and thinking of as we design this. This is not something we've designed in isolation. We obviously need to think what's the market uh, for these biodiversity certificates and credits. And we've been having a number of discussions with the market, including a market working group, which Nicola has been at the forefront of. So we've invited Nicola to come and talk a bit more about what this looks like from the market. So over to you, Nicola. 
Thank you, Keith. Um, yes, hello to everybody. <clears throat> um, I'm Nicola from Good Carbon. And for those of you who don't know Good Carbon, we're a company from Berlin working with corporates to finance high quality nature based solution projects. And we are also developing nature based solution projects with a great focus uh, on community empowerment. So I would also like to start with uh, the gap in financing nature. Um, you might also be familiar with uh, the study from UNEP in 2021 showing and the need for $8 trillion investment uh, into nature uh, in order to uh, conserve and restore nature until 2050. And there is a large gap that needs to be filled. And we need corporates to contribute to close this gap on a very, very large scale. Um, corporates have to take responsibility. Um, as we all know, they can often act faster than governments. And therefore, high quality biodiversity credits are a great opportunity to funnel money from the private sector towards uh, impactful projects. And this is uh, why this is so important. Um, next slide, please. So, and luckily, more corporates are now more uh, putting a, a larger focus on biodiversity. As uh, you know, in the past years, a lot of them, uh, or all of them, have focused uh, on climate commitments. Uh, we uh, saw and still see a lot of net zero commitments, which are very, very important and continue to be so. Um, and there is a lot of emission reduction and compensation efforts through the voluntary carbon market with a large focus on carbon credits. Biodiversity now gets more attention also on the politics side. Um, just to mention COP15, um, the biodiversity COP last year in, in Montreal that yielded the global biodiversity framework as an outcome. And that also includes large expectations from companies to contribute to halting and reversing biodiversity loss by 2030. Um, and I will talk about a few more drivers in a minute. But we see a, a shift um, in the market and a, a lot of especially the larger corporates, but also um, medium-sized companies that expand um, their climate focus to a, to, a, to a nature and biodiversity focus, still including the climate dimension, of course. So we see now nature positivity claims um, on products uh, or also on, on, on whole companies um, and biodiversity impacts um, are being tracked uh, and contribution claims uh, through uh, biodiversity projects uh, um, are hopefully being made soon. And that, of course, uh, can be done through biodiversity credits. Again, I want to point out, uh, even though they seem uh, on a very similar level here, carbon credits and biodiversity credits, um, but Keith already mentioned it, um, biodiversity credits are not to be used uh, for offsetting purposes. So those are for contribution claims only. Next slide, please. So how can corporates benefit when investing into biodiversity credits? And what are the key drivers for corporates to be interested in those? And Joe touched upon some of the drivers and I will uh, repeat some of them and elaborate a bit more on those uh, because they're very, very important. Um, we've here structured them into three buckets um, uh, that I will go into in a second. Just wanted to say that the Biodiversity Credit Alliance just published the results of their survey on key drivers uh, of corporates um, uh, that and that yielded very similar results um, to what we've also discussed in our working group that Keith mentioned and what we have be, we've been experiencing with corporates that we work with. So first of all, to mitigate supply chain risks, well, that encompasses a whole uh, lot of different uh, dimensions. Um, many corporates, unfortunately not all, uh, but most of them have understood uh, that a functioning economy is highly dependent on nature and biodiversity, and they are therefore implementing a nature strategy that they want to adhere to. So this is really about securing economic growth um, and uh, even survival for companies 
uh, obviously depending on the industry, some depend a little more on nature, um, but uh, uh, overall there is uh, the large dependency, which is being more and more understood and acknowledged, which is great. Then we have the brand reputation again that comprises uh, um, different topics. Uh, one is the cons cons consumer pressure, which is rising. Obviously, consumers are getting uh, interested beyond climate, uh, going into biodiversity um, protection and 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 restoration. And therefore, surveys also show in this on this side that um, consumers are asking um, for for the impacts, negative and positive impacts of the products they are buying on biodiversity. And there is also the investor side uh, that Joe uh, also mentioned. Uh, the pressure is rising uh, from the investor side on corporates. There is um, a large uh, factor that is now on biodiversity and nature in ESG ratings. S&P Global, uh, for example, just uh, recently launched a nature and biodiversity risk data set. So just to show you that there is a pressure coming from that side as well. And also with regards to brand reputation, uh, there is obviously just the desire to really um, help nature and, and, and restore our planet. And then there is the big bucket of regulatory requirements. So there are many regulations that are already in place or will be introduced in the near future that will require companies to become active in nature restoration and conservation. Uh, just as an example, in the EU, there is the EU taxonomy that is part of the Green Deal, um, and uh, corporates can enhance their alignment with this taxonomy actually through biodiversity credits, so that there is a very direct um, link to this. And then there is also the CSRD in the EU, uh, which is uh, in being implemented right now, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, uh, which makes it compulsory for companies to report on goals, activities and impacts um, on the environment. Uh, the UK has similar plans and other countries have financial or environmental regulations that are also connected to biodiversity credits. And there are frameworks, international frameworks like TNFD or SBTN, the Science-Based Target Network, uh, that will help corporates to assess and to enhance their positive impacts on nature. So overall, these regulations and the other drivers um, that are in place uh, will hopefully um, uh, create a very healthy competition between corporates um, on who will do best uh, efforts to enhance the biodiversity and biodiversity credits um, and investment in the projects um, is, a, is a very great way to get involved. Uh, next slide, please. So finally, to sum up the market situation or atmosphere, um, we say that corporates are eagerly waiting for biodiversity credits for several reasons. So one um, are the drivers that I just described and that nature strategies uh, are being put together or have been put together and are now being implemented and biodiversity credits are supposed to be part of that. Um, and larger, especially larger corporates are very interested in investing into biodiversity credits um, very soon. And of course, uh, also in the medium sized uh, corporates uh, segment, there are these pioneers that are eagerly waiting for biodiversity investments. Um, in addition to carbon credits, and some even see um, the, 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 the quality control that is kind of implemented into this biodiversity measurement uh, that Torrell has briefly touched upon in the methodology part, they see that as a, as a great asset of biodiversity credits and, 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 and are very eager to, to find out more. And this is and then the, the 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 other reason or the other side why corporates are eagerly waiting for biodiversity credits, it's actually to to understand what biodiversity credits really are, how is the biodiversity measured and then turned into credits, and what kind of projects can be financed or achieved through these biodiversity credits, and what does it cost? So these are all still questions that are uh, open and that we hear a lot in the market and that. Uh, need to be answered and that can be answered now in the future 
uh, with this um, launch <clears throat> of PV Nature that, that provides the possibility then to really implement and do it in practice and, and work together with the market to drive this forward. So this is a very important step. Um, and uh, we, are, we, are, we also want to congratulate again all stakeholders and partners um, and uh, Plan Vivo, most of all, to launch this uh, today. Um, and with this, I hand back uh, to Keith. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nicola. So um, we're almost bang on time, so that's great. A, a few closing remarks. F first of all, I think just taking a step back, I just wanted to highlight that it's so important that we see this demand from the market. We see the projects are there. We all, I'm sure on this webinar, understand the 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 size of the challenge facing us in terms of biodiversity conservation and restoration. Uh, it seems the interest is there. What we're looking for are instruments like PV Nature to try and, and link this together. And that's what we're, we're trying to do. And what's really exciting is, as Nicola said at the end, is this is now something which is live. It's not on just on paper. It's not just great discussions and aspirations. This is a real instrument and it's open uh, and we, we want people to engage from the project side, from the market side. Um, we still have to figure some of the pieces out. We recognize that, but we feel we have a very strong model, a very strong methodology that can fit together to, to kind of make these links. And we, we've got a proven track record from the work in the voluntary carbon market, which we think uh, can really make this work. So we're very excited to take this next step and and to take this next chapter with you guys as well. I want to end, end with just a couple of reminders and a thank you, or a few thank yous. So a reminder, all the documentation will be online and live on Monday the 11th of December. So there's your Christmas plan sorted. You can read in all detail the requirements, the methodology, you name it. There's been loads of great questions. And I think a lot of those questions We've answered a few in the chat, but a lot will be answered with those documents when you get into them online. If they're not answered by those documents or by the FAQs, then please feel free to get in touch with us. Um, a big thanks to all the various people who've been involved in developing PV Nature up to this point. There's many. Uh, the people who participated in the working groups, the project partners, both the pilot projects and now the launch projects, the great uh, team at Pivotal who've done huge work to, to develop and test and design the methodology uh, with us at Plan Vivo. It's fantastic. We've really enjoyed working with you guys and thanks for all the effort on that. And finally, uh, a big thanks to the Plan Vivo team behind this, who you see on the screen at the moment, uh, to Diana, Harry, Evie, Kristen, Luke, and of course, Toril, who's who've led us through, even if she's not on camera at the moment, maybe that's good. She can uh, blush behind the camera, but she's led us through this. So a real big thanks to the team. There's, as you can imagine, there's a huge amount of work and effort to get into this. Um, and we're really excited to be in this, this place uh, together and we look forward to what's to come. So thanks everybody for joining us and uh, we'll see you all in 2024.